Welcome everyone to Tools for Writers. This is our next session on Get Your Writing Done. We have had several webinars so far. This has been organized by the International Student Ambassadors, which I am one of, and uh, also AFOC, the Center for Academic Writing and Communication. Today we have Jella with us, who has been with us also for the other sessions, but we also have Katarina with us. She is a PhD, PhD student and she has worked for AFOC as well and we will have both of them speaking today. First Katarina will go into pre-writing tools um, so how to start writing but not necessarily at the beginning it can be at any stage of the writing process and then Jada will go into more specific tools for example for checking uh, plagiarism, spelling and grammar and feedback um, so we'll go a bit more deeper into that. And then we'll have some time left for questions. If you already have questions, um, you can put them in the chat or in the Q&A. Uh, but also at the end, you can, we'll have a few minutes to discuss them. You can put them in the chat also at the end, whenever you like, and then we'll discuss them. All right, um, let's start. I will give the floor to Katarina now. Thank you. Um, and Judah, could you please... Um... <laughs> Thank you very much. Mm -hmm. And just a few seconds and we're all settled. Um, so let's see. Mm -hmm. If this is a bit slower, forgive me, it's just a technicality, but it should work quite well. Mm -hmm. Um, so again, welcome to, uh, to today's webinar and online workshop. Uh, hopefully it will be of use to you. I'm, uh, I'm very grateful both to Judah and Emma for inviting me and including me in this session. Uh, and I'm also actually very much looking forward to the whole discussion as uh, we, we, there are more of us and uh, we can provide maybe some different insights, maybe even you know, some conflicting insights. So hopefully this will be you know, productive. Uh, so this slide moved on its own. Please ignore it. We're still on the outline slide. Um, in case of any kind of confusion or any kind of questions, I know that Emma will also keep track of it. I will also be, be careful with it. So just feel free to interrupt if something really you know, seems that it's not making sense at all. Um, so as for my part today, I actually wanted to share with you certain tools that I also use personally, especially when I need to actually continue writing, when I need to man maintain my habit, especially motivation, since there is a lot of anxiety going on and a lot of anxiety is tied with the writing process as it is, so inherently in a sense, uh, but in today's circumstances, it's completely, of course, even more understandable to feel uh, anxious to a degree about your work. So overall, you know, do give yourself some or cut yourself some slack and, uh, you know, be kind to, to yourself. So a couple of things that I would address today, uh, consider uh, free writing and as, as Emma basically clearly stated, I will just explain how certain stages uh, can be helpful uh, in continuing with your work. So not necessarily when you're in the initial stage, because I understand, of course, that all of you are now working and have been working on your seminars and MA thesis for a while now. Um, I will also address uh, some benefits of keeping a writing diary, uh, which is a very, very huge benefit, both from the side of uh, you know, managing your research, but also keeping track of your progress. Uh, and um, finally, some notes on planning your writing process. Uh, as Emma mentioned, Judah will continue with topics such as plagiarism, spelling and grammar, and uh, feedback. So to move on a bit concretely to pre-writing, so on this very, very general definition uh, that is usually uh, something that accompanies pre-writing is that it constitutes of uh, a couple of stages uh, of this initial stage of writing. So basically, it does include uh, uh, drafting, revision, uh, editing, uh, proofreading, etc. However, uh, in my opinion, and also in, in other research contributions, there are also discussions that actually pre-writing can be beneficial in other stages as well. 
So we do not need to necessarily talk about free writing only in this initial stage. For example, when you're playing with ideas, uh, when you're considering what to do, uh, how to do it. Uh, but actually also in those stages when you simply need to, for example, begin a new section, uh, clarify your methodology, uh, deepen it a bit more, or simply uh, fight this uh, writer's block that maybe, you know, uh, hinders you at some point. As this happens to us, of course, very often, and it's also a very relevant and uh, normal stage of uh, the writing process. So there are a lot of techniques uh, when it comes to pre-writing as a whole, uh, but um, on this more general um, feature of pre-writing is that uh, you essentially follow um, a very spontaneous train of thought. So whichever technique you actually follow when it comes to pre-writing, you're essentially trying to let your thoughts flow. You're not thinking about spelling, you're not thinking about grammar, you're not thinking about structure. So the point is to get something on paper, even if the something means you expressing your frustration about a certain concept, or a certain uh, theory, uh, idea, or whatever else. So the point is to get you writing. And uh, we can do this in a couple of ways. I will mention just a few. And uh, I myself also rely on those actually quite continuously. So one of them is uh, free writing. I'm quite certain that most of you, if not then some of you, are familiar with the, uh, with the tool and the uh, approach. So essentially free writing is um, when you decide to write about any topic that comes to your mind uh, in a very freestyle way. So again, you're not thinking about the, this rigorous and rigid academic genre. You're not thinking of where to put your references, but you are thinking of just, you know, letting your mind flow and your thoughts flow, for example, for 10 minutes or even for five minutes or 20 minutes. So you're trying to uh, get yourself to have something tangible after that. Um, if you're, for example, continuing uh, on uh, writing on a particular section that needs more clarific clarification, uh, then uh, you could make a couple of sessions uh, of free writing. So for example, uh, if I could write whatever comes to my mind regarding hate speech, uh, with no particular, you know, chronology or, uh, or information, but basically just my general thoughts on it, uh, there are bound to be some dominant ideas that also arise from what I am writing. And then I would take some of those ideas. So for example, I see that I repeated history. I see that I repeated uh, national identity. And then I would try to take those elements and try to free write a bit more on, you know, whatever comes to mind about them. Um, and uh, finally, uh, this one you probably encountered as uh, quite relevant when you're writing your introduction or your abstract, so the journalistic technique. However, um, so again, uh, when I deal with it personally and also while, while working with some MA students on it, it proved incredibly useful uh, when you're actually stuck in a writer's block or simply are not very um, very clear on how to proceed uh, because it forces you to clarify once again for yourself, uh -huh, okay, so what is it that I'm doing? You know, how I want to accomplish this? Why am I doing this? What is the purpose? You know, what is the context? Where would I like to do this? Uh, it helps you pinpoint uh, the parts of your research where you're actually blocking at that stage. And it also helps you to see uh, that some things have changed because when we were very, very involved in the writing process, of course, it's inevitable also that, that some changes will appear. Uh, we will change our minds. Maybe we will use a different theory or a different method. And uh, if you come back to this and sometimes allow yourself to write about like, aha, okay, so, you know, what is it actually that I'm, that I'm doing here? It helps you come back on track. Um, if we would map out like overall benefits uh, of uh, pre-writing like, as a whole, regardless of the stage that you're working on, um, it's uh, incredibly helpful in breaking the, the writing process into different stages. 
because the agenda and the motivation behind pre-writing is for you to simply see, aha, uh -huh, okay, so today I managed, you know, to write a paragraph of something, you know, of my ideas and very random thoughts, but I do have something. Um, it also uh, lets you be in touch with this creative aspect of writing, uh, which we tend to lose sight of when we uh, are very imbued and very embedded in this academic writing process. Uh, as I mentioned earlier, this is pre precisely so because we are dealing with a particular genre. So actually letting go of some of those restrictions uh, that characterize the academic writing genre can be very helpful. You know, it can sort of, you know, for me, it's sort of sometimes this feeling that I'm finally, you know, out of a cage of a sorts. Um, so we mentioned that it helps with writer's block. Uh, and I will also illustrate with a short example to make it even clearer. Um, there were many instances when I started writing uh, precisely uh, to, sh to show why I was angry, for example, about something, or why I was uh, annoyed or frustrated. And on a lot of occasions when I started writing about this and why this work or this approach is uh, challenging for me, you know, all of uh, the expression actually provided me with this you know, impetus actually you know, to continue. You know, to move on and, you know, to try to clarify it a bit more. Um, so the point uh, would be, uh, regardless of, you know, your stage and regardless of um, what your goals would be, is to simply say, okay, you know, I'm, I'm going to write, you know, one paragraph or a hundred words uh, of simply something. But again, I will have something that I can look back on tomorrow that I can build on further and go back to. And the one tool that can help you in this process is uh, quite a cool tool that I stumbled on recently. So is this ILIS uh, tool, it's free. Uh, at least it's free until the end of 2020, as it seems that this is the case with many tools at the moment. Uh, it's fairly straightforward and self-explanatory, but essentially uh, what it does is that um, uh, you log in for free, you set a goal. So for example, you say you will write 200 words and uh, you simply start writing. But the tricky thing is that you actually don't see your progress. You can't go back, you can delete. So the only uh, stage when you can actually see what you wrote is when you actually uh, attain your goal. So when you actually get to those 50 words or 200 words or 500 words. Uh, so in terms of you getting into this habit of uh, free writing, it can be extremely helpful. So uh, as we often say uh, in, in Navok, I mean in general, of course, you know, none of the tools or models that we tend to use need to be ideal and this is not their purpose. But at least, you know, I would encourage you to take some time and uh, try them out because you may be surprised. So when you register, this is what you will see. Uh, the system will ask you how many words would you like to uh, uh, achieve today. And uh, when you set, you know, ready to flow and go, you will see a black screen and you can simply start writing. But then again, you know, you won't be able to see any results until you actually get to the, uh, to the end and achieve your goal. Uh, and slowly getting towards the end uh, also of my part, what I would like to share, uh, which I think is extremely relevant in any stage of, of your writing, but especially now when I, I know that we all need a bit more uh, motivation, since the defenses seminar submissions are, are approaching, uh, a, a, a writing diary is something that can help you in this process. So I put this daily in brackets, simply because of course it doesn't have to be, you know, a daily writing diary, ideally uh, it could be. So, you know, I encourage you to at least try it out. Uh, so what would be the point of this writing diary? So the point would be like on each day when you actually write something, whatever that may be, if, if it's a pre-writing session, uh, something else, it, it doesn't matter. But whatever tiny movement, you know, and, and uh, step that you actually make in your writing, the diary serves this purpose to explain to yourself what you accomplished that day. Again, no matter how small it seems to you, 
you know, every step is some, some level of a movement and we should all remember this. Um, also to be reflective about what was challenging in the process and why was it challenging. So for example, you had difficulty with a particular concept or a particular theory or phrasing something or something else. Uh, finally, what are the next steps? So what do you plan on doing tomorrow to try and clarify this? And simply, what are the next steps to proceed? So uh, this is helpful in a variety of ways, of course. First and foremost, uh, honestly, it's even somewhat therapeutic. Uh, it really does help you to self-reflect because actually, um, if, you, if you ever tried it, you, you will also probably be very aware that you know, being conscious and being aware of what are your you know, shortcomings at the moment and what are your challenges is very valuable. Because only by actually knowing this is it easier for us also to continue. So when you actually look at the writing diary, it helps you to continue where you left off the previous day or three days before. Uh, it helps you track your progress. And also you have this very tangible evidence uh, of your progress. So to illustrate, um, this is an example of uh, my writing diary. I use Google Docs. Uh, for now. Uh, and Google Docs have been very helpful. To be very honest, um, of course, there are some days that, you know, I, I have no uh, additions simply because a couple of days have passed. Maybe I had some difficult times when it comes to writing. Uh, so again, it does not have to be daily, but even if it's the slightest movement, uh, try to look how it works for you, you know, test it out, see how you feel, go back to it. And hopefully, you know, it will, you know, lead you somewhere. I know that I feel very good when I see it in the morning. Uh, even if I had a shorter break, uh, even if it was because of some, you know, anxiety blocks or whatever, when I see what I actually did manage to do, it motivates me to continue further on. And then I just, you know, try to explain why I was blocking, what was the problem and uh, proceed from there. Um, and a concluding remark, uh, just about this remaining time uh, that you all are dealing with now in terms of planning your writing process um, is more of this maybe logistic part of the whole deal. However, it's very, very uh, important without a doubt. So uh, just a couple of notes on it. Um, one of them would be to please, again, you know, uh, be kind to yourself and try to break the process down. You know, break it into pieces. So uh, don't tell yourself, you know, okay, I need to write, I don't know, 12 pages today or nothing. You know, uh, try to be just a bit more realistic, uh, aware of your productivity and what you can do. So, you know, try with some smaller chunks uh, of whatever you're actually currently working on. Um, ideally, uh, even if you're not the type who likes to plan out their activities, I think this is uh, extremely helpful. So try to list the tasks that, that, that await you and allocate time for them. So one of my colleagues recently pointed out a very um, like interesting technique that works for her. So when she is dealing with an article uh, that she's uh, writing, and that she needs to uh, modify and work on certain sections. What she does is she tells herself, okay, so I have 25 minutes for this. And after that, I'm, I'm moving to the next section. You know, then I have a half an hour for this, then I move on. Uh, it simply prevents you from falling into that loop and this feeling, oh, okay, I have the whole day, you know, and then dragging yourself, you know, over one section and sort of um, getting stuck in a loop. Um, thirdly, uh, try to set deadlines for your draft, uh, regardless of uh, whether you're working on an article, on a seminar, or a thesis, especially if you're working on a thesis. Uh, specify what you will be working on in each draft, and then try to organize your time in such a way. Uh, be very conscious about other responsibilities. I'm, I'm thinking also in terms of uh, not even when we are in these usual circumstances, but uh, even now in particular, uh, I'm aware that uh, possibly, you know, a lot of people have different responsibilities at the moment. So maybe some of you are actually taking much more care about some of your family members. 
uh, maybe or simply, of course, much, much more worried about certain things than, than not. So there are many elements uh, that actually fall into this category of, you know, how uh, we plan our writing process and how successful we end up being in it. So simply be aware of those other responsibilities that you have in mind and uh, uh, remain simply you know, aware of them uh, to, to be able to also plan for the unforeseen. So we saw that this is something that, uh, you know, is very hard to control. I mean, even impossible and things can happen. However, you know, if you still have an idea and uh, map out for yourself, you know, what are the potential scenarios, you know, in case, you know, this happens or in case that happens and think about whether I will have, I don't know, whether I will need more time to write something if I do not have access to certain material. So what does this mean for the progress of my writing? Or what, is, what does it mean if I need to conduct field work uh, and I can't do this at the moment? Or maybe certain people are simply uh, not you know, available even via phone or Skype. So all of those things, even if they're not happening, are very good to take into account. And uh, lastly, um, and very connected to the previous point, uh, try to take into account both long-term versus short-term plans. So short-term plans in terms of those daily you know, and weekly plans help you stay on track and help you actually see, aha, uh -huh, you know, so I'm actually making small progress. You know, it is movement. It seems slow to me, but actually, you know, I'm getting somewhere. Uh, as opposed to, for example, uh, you having to submit your thesis or a section of your thesis in three weeks to your supervisor. So try to map out those long-term goals and short-term goals to make it a bit easier for yourself. And lastly, listen to yourself when it comes to productivity. Uh, I think there is no ideal way you know, for any of us actually to how we approach something in terms of, I can't claim that it's ideal to write every day at six in the morning. Uh, for some people, and for some of my colleagues, this is wonderful. Uh, for some others, they work in the evenings. Some others, you know, even later in the middle of the night. Point is here, whatever works for you, uh, listen to yourself, but do consider the elements that actually make you most productive and uh, try to make them work for you. And um, I have added a couple of tools that uh, you're also very welcome to check uh, on your own time. Um, some of them are tied uh, to mind mapping, some of them on other free writing techniques. Uh, so hopefully uh, they will be interesting for you. And most importantly, all of them are also free. So um, that would be it uh, for me, at least for the time being. And uh, I hope that it was uh, clear and at least on this level useful for you. And obviously any questions are welcome uh, later on. Uh, I think that's, uh, that's my cue. So thank you very much, uh, Katerina. Um, I think what's absolutely clear from, um, you know, from Katarina's talk and what you have mentioned is something that we have discussed as well in the other webinars, uh, which is, of course, that this whole writing process is very much a, uh, an emotional process as well, you know, something that we just need to go through and something that we have to, um, to understand personally how we deal with those complexities. Uh, and how we organize those complexities in our own uh, in our own working environment, and of course, at the moment, uh, you know, like like you have said very clearly, it is it is a very you know strange environment to be in. Um, well, moving on from from that topic, I will talk about uh, well topics which are related and and both unrelated. Um, in terms of you know how we deal with the writing, so I'm looking more at um, at topics which which really focus on you know the end product. Um, so we talk about the process of writing, but also the product of writing. And um, despite the fact that I will talk a little bit about you know those product uh, tools, they also can be really useful when we think about the process. So they are completely uh, linked with each other. Um, a very popular topic, of course, is, is plagiarism. And, uh, and to be honest, I think plagiarism is something which 
uh, well, we do not talk about enough or we do not understand enough. And the other thing that I have to admit when, when I talk about plagiarism is that for me to now present plagiarism in such a short period of time is not something which I like to do, uh, primarily because you know, we need a much larger understanding of, of how we deal with plagiarism as a whole. And I also think that the word plagiarism is, um, is, is, is a little bit of a bad word to use, right? So uh, as educators, you know, as a university, as instructors, we like to you know, talk about, yeah, I'm going to check your plagiarism and uh, you know, I'm going to police your work and make sure that, it's, you know, that you're not going to break the law or break the rules. And um, so it has this kind of like negative connotation that, that I think that we need to better understand in, in order to try and get rid of that negative connotation, because we all fear somehow, okay, right, I'm going to submit something, you know, it has this kind of like 4% or 10% um, uh, let's say, com uh, similarity score if we submit it in a uh, plagiarism tool, you know, then, oh no, does that mean that I am not going to pass? So plagiarism is, is you know, not that. So when we talk about plagiarism, uh, we actually really talk about uh, this, right? So plagiarism is the uncredited use, and then we talk about both intentional and unintentional of somebody else's words or ideas. And that's something that you really, really have to uh, understand what that means. So I'll, I will give you maybe a couple of seconds of silence to think about what that means, right? So plagiarism is the uncredited use of both intentional and unintentional uh, of somebody else's words or ideas. Yeah, and, and silence is maybe a, somewhat of a good reflection to think about specifically the uncredited aspects, but also the intentional and unintentional, right? So anybody else's words or ideas is something that we need to give them credit to, right? So we need to make sure that we uh, acknowledge, you know, that what they have thought or what they have written, that we tell them that those are their words and not mine. And of course that we need a whole system in order to make sure that we do this. So we have the APA, uh, system, we have MLA, we have Chicago, for example, you know, ways in which we can make references or citations to those sources. Um, and if we don't understand them fully enough, then of course we might end up in that unintentional, uncredited use of somebody else's words or ideas. Of course, the more serious one is really the intentional one, right? So that's the part where you deliberately choose to copy somebody else's work, paste it in your text, and then you know submit it with the hope you know that it's not going to be uh, discovered you know so that's of course the worst form of plagiarism and we see this very very few cases um, you know this is really happens in the case where you know somebody runs out of time thinks okay well i need to submit something else something anyway because if i don't i will fail and what might i do is okay well i will look for ways to collect text copy paste it and submit it it's very rare the unintentional, of course, is much more serious and, and something that we can address much more um, uh, systematically, specifically when we talk about the writing process, you know, specifically when we implement those things that Katarina has talked about. Um, so how do we avoid plagiarism? Uh, and this is a nice overview that was presented by the Purdue Writing Lab, which is also a source I will present later on. Uh, but basically what it comes down to is that you have to develop a topic based on what has already been said and written, right? So that's quite clear. But you have to write something new and original, right? So that new and original is the aspect that you need to include in order to avoid, you know, that topic that you are already developing. So you have to rely on experts and authorities' opinion, right? But what you need to do is to improve on those you either disagree or agree or provide different ways of looking at it. You have to give credit to previous researchers, but you have to make your own significant contribution, right? And this does take a lot of critical thinking. What do they say and how can I turn that into a new significant way of looking at it, right? That could just be a very minute way, uh, but at least you need to find a way, right? So your thoughts really do matter. You have to find a way to, uh, you know, construct your ideas about any given uh, 
any given research that you that you read. And then, of course, the, the last one is that you need to improve your English, right, to fit into a discourse community by building upon what you hear and read. But you have to use your own words in, uh, and your own voice. And you might remember that we spoke about voice in another seminar. It is really, again, essential that you do find the confidence in yourself, um, you know, that the way that you will uh, write things, you know, actually do matter. And, you know, we had the academic phrase bank in order to help you to find ways to formulate things. So you need to find that, that voice and you need to find confidence to, um, you know, to, to make it work for you in this, in this context. So the question then is also, well, when do you give credit, right? So at what point do we need to actually cite sources? And, and this is a general, again, guideline that we need to use. It's any words, any ideas, or diagrams, illustration, charts, pictures, media, audio, etc., which has or originated outside of you, right? So when we think about this, that's a lot of credit that we need to give to others. But when you actually evaluate your text, yeah, you will be able to make that distinction between the things which are yours and the things which you have received from others, right? And that's what we do quite often with, you know, putting things in quotation marks, right? So we know that those are words that I've taken from another text, and I know that I need to make a reference to those. Sometimes we might feel, okay, well, you know, the way things are written in another book or written by another author really is a good way that they have formulated it, and I wouldn't be able to do it any other ways. What you need to do is you need to just copy paste down in a piece of, uh, in, a, in a document and then start to rewrite it, rewrite it, rethink and rework that text until all of a sudden it becomes your own idea, right? So we need to work with the words and ideas of others and to transform those to make them our own, right? So that's really what we need to do because otherwise they have originated outside of you, right? So ideas of course, and words that come from others are something we use in order to construct knowledge. And that knowledge that has been constructed is yours, right? And that does not need to give uh, need to be given credit. Although we do need to give credit to the source where it has uh, come from. Um, so what do we not need to give credit then? Uh, well, these are of course your own results, and uh, you might be in the field where you are, you know, presenting experiments. Uh, you know, you have results. These are your results, and of course, you do not need to give uh, a, you know, a reference to those because these are yours. You also do not need to give a credit to your own lived experiences, your own observations, you know, your thoughts and conclusions about a topic. And again, this what uh, Katarina talked about is again an incredibly useful tool or, or you know, process in, in which you can actually map those and, and, and work out a couple, you know, I actually think about this according uh, on about that topic, you know, I work out these kind of ideas or, you know, I have these kind of observations and you put them in there and you need to not make reference to those, but, um, well, you don't need to make references to those, right? But you again do need to make references to where that knowledge comes from. Uh, so those are the things that um, will come back again to the slide that we had earlier. The other thing you do not need to give credit to is your own artwork. So when you make tables, uh, when you make diagrams, uh, when you create images and graphs, you know, those are yours. You do not give to make, uh, give a credit to those. And then we have the, well, the last two, and, and that's where we might come into a little bit of a muddy, muddy waters, you know, common knowledge and common sense observations and general facts, right? So what are common knowledge and common sense observations? Um, you know, we could uh, think about, well, an example such as, you know, the earth circles the sun. Um, you know, that's common knowledge. Uh, if in your field, you know, that actually is not common knowledge, you might need to make a reference to a source. But I think generally we could agree that that's common knowledge. You know, the same as that we can state that the earth is round. Uh, there are people who might disagree with that, but I think that, you know, most of us would agree that the earth is round and therefore we do not need to make uh, a, a reference to that statement. Um, obs sense observations could also be things like, well, when spring comes around, you know, flower starts to bloom. Um, you know, that could be just a common sense uh, observation. It does not need to uh, take a reference. Um, 
and, and general facts. And general facts, uh, I was just actually thinking about, you know, this whole situation in w which we are in at the moment, you know, with the whole COVID-19 uh, lockdown and just trying to work out, you know, what are some general facts that we do know about, you know, COVID-19. And of course, these facts seem to be changing, uh, you know, but we could, for example, say that the coronavirus, you know, is a large virus family with seven known types, for example, you know, that's related to coronaviruses. Or at this point, you know, we could make a general fact, you know, which does not need to be given a reference, for example, then, the WHO has provided uh, 47,095 masks. Yeah? And if you would want to know where that source came from, well, we would most likely be able to find it from the WHO website. The other thing that we might need to do with these kind of like general fact statements is that they might be need, they might need to be given a timestamp, right? So as of today, for example, or, you know, in January, uh, so that we would be able to find out what, if those references are true or not. Um, again, some of those general facts uh, statements are, you, you know, you could decide to give them a, uh, a reference. But in general, if we can all accept that it's a general fact, then it's not necessary. So stages that you need to go through or strategies that you need to apply in order to avoid plagiarism. And for those of you, I think, who followed the first webinar, I think there was a question about this. And of course, writing the text as a process will absolutely avoid you to plagiarize anything, right? So if you're writing drafts, um, and that's I think also point five here, you know, you basically are not plagiarizing. It just means that you're working with your text, you're working with ideas. Um, but just to go down the list here, right? So we have reading and note taking, incredibly important, right? So everything you read, you need to take a note of. And you need to take a note of all of the uh, essential information that someone goes into your thesis or into your essay and think about, okay, well, what does this do? And is this a notable fact that I want to use? Is it a general fact that I can use? Or, you know, is it a uh, important quotation mark that I want to include? And just make sure that you will be able to find back where that came from. The biggest problem often is that when we're writing, you know, we're also reading and we're absorbing and we sometimes at the end don't know where that actually came from. And if you don't know where it came from, but you do know that you need to reference it, you know, then you're again thinking, okay, well, if I can't find it, what do I do with it? Well, you actually would need to have to take it out. And that would, of course, be a pity. So you really need to make sure that you find uh, that you will be able to link all of that knowledge uh, where it has come from and whether you need to make a reference to it or not. Um, well, writing, par uh, writing paraphrase or summaries, right? So that's, again, when you're reading, try to summarize the text that you have read. You know, and, or what another thing to do, and that's maybe something that's linked to the final thing that I want to say about feedback, uh, is that for example, creating reading groups, right? So you're writing text and then you start talking about that text or having a discussion about text, text uh, having discu discussions about what it means. Uh, quite often this will give you some good insights as to how you would be able to write about it, but also how you would be able to talk about it. Uh, then we have uh, writing direct quotations. This someone goes back to the point I made in, in the first point here. Uh, you know, make sure that you write them down and where they came from. And then writing about ideas, um, you know, make sure that you think about uh, your, uh, the ideas that you want to present in your text and then just free write about those. You know, think about, okay, well, what does that mean? You know, do I believe that these are uh, applicable or not? Um, or, you know, is that based on an observation or is that something that I can test, right? Um, and then the fifth point, as I mentioned, is maintaining drafts of your paper. The other important thing about maintaining drafts of your paper and maintaining, you know, a good system for keeping those drafts is let's say, for example, in the end, you know, your the committee says, okay, well, I think, you know, there's plagiarism in your text. You would be able to, for example, go back into your draft and say, okay, well, but look, this is what it looked like at the first stage. And then, you know, this is how I'm sort of like revising my text. So, you know, there's a lot of process going in there. And, you know, if it really is plagiarized, then, well, you know, you just need to find out exactly where that comes from. And, you know, that's 
uh, will link to my, my point in the next uh, slide. Um, and then the final uh, point, point six here is, of course, revising, proofreading, and finalizing your paper. You know, you do need to spend a lot of time and a lot of thought about, you know, the way that the text is presented and whether everything that you are presenting is correct in that sense, right? So you have used the right references. You have included all of those references in your references list. Um, so then anybody who would want to know or, you know, can see that you have been very thorough in including them in your uh, in your list. Okay, well that brings me to the plagiarism tool uh, Urkund, which is the University of Tartu plagiarism system. Uh, so all instructors in the university has access to uh, Urkund, which means that if you submit text, um, in, uh, and especially if you start to submit your thesis, the committee will run it through Urkund and to see whether there is a, a percentage of similarity you have to understand that the percentage of similarity is not the same as plagiarizing, right? Uh, so what, what that percentage of similarity does is it actually sees that there, you know, is a 20% similarity to uh, original text found on, on, in the databases. It could be actually that all of those, you know, uh, sources that were found or similarities that were found were correctly uh, uh, referenced to, which means that there's no plagiarism. If the system actually sees that there's, let's say, for example, 20% similarity, and you can see clearly that no references are made, then of course we talk about plagiarism. Um, the good thing is that uh, it is possible for you to use Urkund as well as a tool for you to work through the process of checking your text, right? So if you log into Moodle there and you search for the course Urkund plagiarism, uh, you will find this, uh, well, this course. And uh, you will be able to actually submit your document in Moodle and you will get that similarity score. Now, I advise anybody who is going to do this to really evaluate and see the similarities between those texts and the sources as a way of learning how you then may need to change your text or you know, what it actually does. So, when we talk about plagiarism, and that's why I quite often do not like to talk about plagiarism, you know, we need to use these kind of tools as an educational, uh, as an educational tool, right? We should not use it as a tool to check in the end and police it. So you should use that tool and see, you know, where there might be places that, uh, that actually show similarity because you actually did not know where that source came from, for example. So you can use it as a tool to help you in the writing process. Okay, well, that's it for plagiarism. Uh, talk a little bit about uh, well, spelling, grammar, you know, language checking, uh, more or less. And I think all of you have been confronted with the Grammarly um, advertisements everywhere. Um, and some of you might have used Grammarly or some of you actually use Grammarly a lot. Uh, personally, I don't. Uh, I, I just think it's invasive and it just distracts me enormously. And that's the same with the spelling checker in words. It just distracts me because, you know, at this point, I don't, you know, I might misspell words and, you know, I don't want to be bothered by that. I don't want to see that red line or I don't want to see the uh, suggestions on how I need to improve it because it kills my flow of writing. So my suggestion is, is that if you are going to check your text for grammar and spelling, then a tool like Grammarly would be useful. But again, do this at a time when you are, for example, taking checking language uh, as a stage of your writing. Right? So again, the tool that uh, Katharina presented, uh, you know, where the text disappears, this is you know, super. I think it's a great tool, primarily because you can't see whether you have misspelled anything. Uh, or, you know, have uh, grammatical mistakes. But what you do is you take that text which comes out, you know, and then you can say, okay, well, now I would like to use that text. I'm going to put it in my, uh, in my thesis or in my essay. And okay, well, before I do this, let me just, you know, check the language and, and grammar. And then, you know, you run it through a grammar and spelling checker. You know, that might be useful. Uh, another tool which, you know, I could suggest, um, and maybe some of you might already know it, it's called the Hemingway app. And the Hemingway app is a free 
uh, to use uh, online. And what Hemingway app actually does, it's, it's both a writing and an editing tool. Uh, so you can use the writing uh, environment online to construct text. Uh, and as you can see, it will give you a readability score. And readability scores are quite interesting as it will give you a good sense how readable your text is exactly as the score says. Uh, I don't want to go too much into that, but a grade six is a good score. Um, so the more academic we actually get or the more formal we get with our uh, writing, it will give you a worse score, right? So readability scores actually will score good uh, reading uh, based on ease of reading. Um, and the way that it also uh, evaluates this is, for example, the use of uh, passive voice. If you use a lot of passive voice, it becomes more difficult to read. Um, for example, it will highlight some of the sentences which are hard to read. Um, and um, well, it, it also gives you some, some suggestions and tips. So this is a really useful tool, again, not when you're writing, but if you want to evaluate your writing. And at some stage, it's good to just, you know, take your text and try to evaluate your writing, right? Um, it also has a desktop app, but I think you have to pay for it. It's maybe not that much, but, uh, you know, it's something to, to consider. And then another tool which I can suggest, again, it's a spelling checker and grammar checker and, uh, you know, diagnostic tool is uh, Quill. And, uh, you know, like so many apps, it's uh, free till the end of the 2019-2020 academic year. So I, again, that if you want to check your grammar and check your spelling and have your text proofread, you know, try Quill and let's see how that works for you. So make use of the, you know, the fact that those tools are freely available at the moment. Uh, another source for those of you who really are interested to become much more familiar with writing and uh, and that's why I'm so happy also that you know that I'm working with Katarina as well on these topics because we we you know as Katarina also mentioned earlier we've worked actually a lot together on writing and helping students to uh, think about writing so Avok is that kind of center so we actually don't fix writing, but we actually want to make writing visible, right? So if you go to the uh, US, most of the universities have what they call writing centers and um, or writing labs. And the OWL or the Purdue Writing Center is the one of the oldest and one of the earliest that has good resources online. So their online research resources are really, really good. But again, like I said, you know, these resources about getting a better understanding about writing. Uh, and of course, it gives you some good tips and, and uh, suggestions on, you know, what you can do in order to, uh, to fix your writing. If you need to write, my suggestion is just to write, you know, don't read about writing, but write. Uh, but if you really are interested in learning more about writing, then uh, this source is a good source to, uh, to look at. Um, then, you know, finally, uh, as Katarina also mentioned, you know, keeping a diary, a writing diary, but actually making sure that you put in your diary time for writing is essential. Uh, you know, so reserve those blocks for yourself and say, okay, well, from the morning, 9 to 11, I'm going to write. And just, you know, do it and, and you will see how, how much your productivity will increase. And the final thing that I want to say, so there's still some time left for questions and, and answers, um, is just, you know, again, use feedback as much as you can. Uh, we talked about this in all the other sessions, for sure, uh, because it's one of the things that, you know, we really, really promote uh, very strongly, is in order for you to talk about your writing with others, uh, about your writing with others, really helps you to get a much better understanding of the things that you are writing. So like I said earlier as well, you know, your share your thoughts about the reading, you will be able to, you know, put those words in your mouth and you will be able to put those words on paper as well. Right, so talking about it, reading about it, talking about it again, socializing about it, receiving feedback on this is a real essential process of that writing. And, you know, so Katarina and I, we were talking about this earlier as well. 
uh, you know, we always suggest, uh, you know, students to just, you know, find small groups, you know, friends, uh, you know, classmates to just say, okay, well, let's, let's, you know, get together and, and let's share, you know, our writing and, and see what, what we can do uh, in order to help each other. Because it's, again, it's a give or take, you know, you read my text, I read your text, you know, you give me feedback, I give you feedback. And, you know, the benefits are, are enormous. So we need to talk about our writing. You need to talk about your writing. And again, you know, that's also very, very uh, helpful to just, uh, you know, think about your own well-being uh, when you're writing. Okay, well, I will leave it at that. Again, well, thank you uh, for well, sticking with us. Um, thank you, Katarina, also for taking uh, what was, you know, the first part of the presentation. And again, thank you, Emma and Aisa, for, you know, uh, initiating these, uh, these webinars. Yeah, thanks a lot, Katarina and Jeddah. I think that was very, very helpful. We already got quite some questions, so um, let's spend some, some time on that as well. Um, I saw someone asking about the recording and the slides. Yes, uh, everyone who has signed up will get an email with uh, the recording and the PowerPoint in there as well. Um, now, concerning the content, um, it was asked if there are any softwares recommended um, for, let's see, for note taking. Do you have any recommendations on that? Katarina? Do you want to take this one? I was thinking Zotero. Yeah, um, actually Zotero is a really good one, uh, as well as Mendeley, I think. Um, Would you write it in the, tra in the chat so we know how to spell it? Sure, uh, I will write it in the chat. Oh, I, can, I can write it down, yeah. Sure. Yeah, so Zotero and Mendeley are um, uh, referencing managing, reference management tools. And they are also really useful in order to, of course, manage your references. But what you can do with them is, for example, import PDFs. And for example, in those PDFs, you can highlight or you can take notes. And once you have those notes and highlights collected in a PDF, you can actually ask Mendeley to extract them. So what you will have is then a list of all the notes and highlights that you have from a PDF. It, it takes a little bit of sorting out, but there are some really useful uh, instructional videos in, in YouTube, of course, in order to find out how they work. But absolutely, like Katarina said, you know, Mendeley Sotero, these are, I think, maybe one of the most useful tools because, you know, um, especially for digital documents. Mm. When it comes to, you know, taking notes, from, you know, text, uh, you know, so paper documents. You know, I don't have my notebook here with me, but I love Moleskine notebooks. You know, they are my to-go place. And I, I use a archaic fountain pen to write my notes, you know, and, uh, and, and a notebook. And that really works for me. So. Um, All right. Thank mm -hmm. you. Um, we got another question from Savio asking this, uh, what the similarity in plagiarism percentage is that is accepted by UT for your for example, your thesis. Uh, yeah, as I explained, um, so that uh, percentage really doesn't say anything unless it is being checked. The biggest problem that we see is that some of the instructors don't quite um, understand this. And then I, I, the, the, I mean, the way that I need to frame this is that not so much that they don't understand, but they will look at it as a reference. Right, so let's throw those texts in the, um, in the plagiarism, so in Urkund, and let's see what comes out. And if it, says it, ha if it has a score like 20, then I will check. Um, but, you know, even if there's a score of zero, I would still, you know, suggest any instructor to check, you know, what, what it actually means. So how come it is actually zero? Because even for score zero, I as an instructor, I would be worried. Or okay. words, I would have my questions. Yeah. So, so again, you know, to, a straightforward answer to that is that those percentages really do not mean anything for you as a student. All right. Let's see. We don't have a lot of time left, but we do have a lot of questions. Mm -hmm. um, 
Let's see. Is it also possible for students outside of UT to um, check this tool in the Moodle? Um, no, because okay. you would need a Moodle uh, access to Moodle, and you can only get access to Moodle with the university uh, credentials. Right. There's a question about doing research before the writing or during the writing. Um, and someone said that professors suggest to do the research before and then to write. Um, but some students, it works better, of course, to do it at the same time. Uh, what would you generally suggest for social science students? Would you suggest a different approach than other fields or not? We actually talked about this recently, I think, Judah. Uh, in our shut up and write sessions. Uh, okay, so in terms of the humanities, social sciences, if it needs to be put in that kind of a context, I think, you know, reading and writing as processes are definitely inseparable. So I think you actually shouldn't, you know, uh, separate them simply because, as Jude also pointed out, you know, whenever you're also reading and exploring something new, uh, you can at least write a summary you know, or clarify some ideas and question how they actually um, build, how they actually fit well into your overarching, you know, research questions and uh, research uh, objectives. So I think it's, it's always a very intertwined process. I mean, of course, when you're actually getting towards the end uh, of, fin you know, you're finishing your seminar or you're finishing your article or your thesis, you know, somewhere in between, obviously there will be much more writing. So we also need to know when to actually stop, you know, falling into the trap of finding, oh, this is a new cool text or this is a new cool text. So certainly a balance is necessary. But uh, to sum it up, I think they're definitely intertwined and uh, they work best together. So both reading and writing. Mm -hmm. Completely agree. Mm -hmm. All right. Um, someone asked a question about the use of Hemingway, where if it indicates that some sentences are hard to read, um, isn't this uh, the way that you are supposed to write for academic writing to make, to show some, some more knowledge maybe, to use some more difficult words instead of writing it like it's a blog? What would you say? Yeah, I, I, I love that question. I really love that question because it does really represent the, some of the misconceptions I think that we have about writing. Because no, 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 no. We need to make sure, because we're writing for somebody, you know, somebody is going to read that text. Imagine if you are going to read that text and you're just, you know, just, you, you don't understand what it says. You know, you're thinking and thinking and thinking and you have no idea. You know, I will stop reading. I mean, I, I don't want to, you know, I, I have, yeah, I, I can't get, because it, what it will give me is thinking like, okay, well, maybe I'm stupid. You know, maybe I just don't understand it or, so it's, it's, no. No, no, no. All right, very clear, very clear. Okay, uh, I think we're gonna have to end with that. Uh, thank you very much everyone for participating. I hope it was interesting and informative uh, for you. And Judah and Katarina, thank you very, very much. Thank you also to AFOC in general. Um, you've been of a lot of help to ISA and I think we organized some very informative webinars. And um, yeah, everyone at home, I hope you stay healthy and I hope that you get your writing done. And like I mentioned, we will share the recording as well with you and the PowerPoint so you can have a, a look at it later. All right, thank you very much and stay healthy. Thank you, Emma. Thank you, Emma. Karina. Thanks everyone. And uh, yeah, we'll try to address those questions which we have not answered um, in the response that we will, or the video recording that we will send to everyone. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yes, and actually, if if you do, you have or you have the links, and you have actually the logos of Avok and then communicating science. So basically, for all of you, you know not to feel ignored. Uh, feel free to email us or just you know be in touch uh, via Facebook or something, so we can address any concerns. Absolutely. So thank you.